The quality Filipino women anticipated a qualitative change when a new administration of our President Rodrigo Roa Duterte came into power in May of 2016, replacing the callous, incompetent, corrupt, and elitist government of uh, Benigno Senor Aquino III. Thus, women have a word in interpreter. I request you to translate this English into the other languages. The women have forwarded this agenda on July 2016 when the new president was installed. It compassing political, social, economic, and cultural aspects as deemed necessary to uplift uh, them from poverty and subjugation. But after two years, the situation of women and the rest of the Filipino people, including women, had suffered from the 10-point socioeconomic agenda that brings into play a similar neoliberal agenda of the previous administration. The, uh, the third economics, as we call it, is the socioeconomic policy of the President uh, Duterte, so as far to be with the developed countries by 2022. It anchors with the 10 principles that basically enumerates the framework, framework of neoliberalism, the free market capitalism, as a major part of economic strategy of our government is now the build, build, build to apparently sustain the country's growth. Women as, uh, owns half of the population that experienced the economic policy of our president, the neoliberal framework. It has caused the toiling class women in a myriad of concerns such as hunger, job security, landlessness, want of basic services, discrimi discrimination, misogyny, violence, and human rights violation, among others. As mentioned, because of the inflation, creeping inflation last uh, from between July 2016 to December 17. Uh, it's, it uh, pushes high, but the record high in 10.7 uh, inflation last September 2018 has recorded in the Philippines, causing more hunger. Among the Filipino, the, the average before uh, it used to be an average of 60.8 allocated budget to buy food. But now, since the inflation has rise, 35.3% has uh, been allotted to buy food for the family. According to the Center for Women's Resources, there have been um, To cope up with uh, the situation of hunger, families are cutting short their, their meals. Some worst imagine or memorize uh, the food. Meaning, if we eat now, we just imagine how delicious, how nutritious it is for the family to eat. We also have the so-called pecking duck. Uh, people from the urban poor communities uh, gather leftover foods from the restaurants. And the third, we also have what we call a tanghap. It's a single meal between 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., including the breakfast, lunch, and uh, dinner. So it's a one meal per day. Piso piso. Is a rice with one peso munchable or junk food, as we call it, chicharia. Next. So, hunger leads to malnutrition. One in three Filipino children are malnourished and stunted. 
Also, the, the prevalence of nutritionally at risk pregnant women remained high at 24.8%, with pregnant teenagers girls most likely to be nutritionally at risk at 37.2%. Misogyny and discriminatory cultural stereotypes uh, perpetuates violence against women. Our uh, next. It is personified by our fascist macho President Duterte, who have been uh, saying a lot of things about uh, anti-women remarks. You will see from the slides. According to his uh, cabinet member, his spokesperson, it is only a joke or a humor that he, he had to say about women. But of course, Gabriela and other women's organization have been actively uh, Opposing those sexist remarks against against women, the persistence of violence against, violence against women as embodied by our president and its uh, uh, cabinet members persists as women and children suffer from violence. You will see the cases. 74% of rape victims in the Philippines are children. Continuing trafficking of women and children as poverty worsen. On health, the president has boasted his uh, administration success in serving the public, providing a comfortable life. Among the quote-unquote success is the expansion of our health insurance coverage and benefits, reducing out-of-pocket spending, and attaining and sustaining zero unmet needs to the family, for family planning. However, the so-called success have failed to mention that the services, services in tune with the privatization of our health care. Now, most of our public hospitals are being privatized. Maternal and health uh, issues also continue. The recent uh, Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Law, or formerly known as the RH Law, however, uh, they said that it, was, uh, it has been successful but has to be measured because the budget has been cut for for uh, for the families as well as access to maternal health care. The RH law also limits oh, the no that no no uh, the no home birthing policy that burdens uh, the women. Medical services and supplies are still, are still limited. Six out of ten indigent members are still have to shoulder the expenses to settle their hospitals. Health workers are still not a priority. There have been a shortage of budget in health workers uh, in the Philippines since 2014. There are only 2.3 healthcare workers per 10,000 10, population in the Philippines, which is apparently low compared to ideal ratio of 44 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. In addition, majority of the Filipino patients rely on the services of public health facilities served by only 4.5% uh, doctors out of the 66,000 total. There are only about 1% of the 500 nurses and some 20% of 74,000 midwives in the country are serving the public facilities. It, the Tainvaksha issue was an international clamor where mothers have been anxious of the effect 
of the Tevaxia uh, vaccine, which reportedly would be fatal to children who have to not be inflicted by the dengue. As admitted by multinational uh, manufacturer Sanofi Pasteur, while the past Aquino administration is guilty of the Tevaxia crisis, it has been initiated in 2016. The Duterte administration is equally accountable for the program pushed through at the present. There, are, there is a pending case on the Tevaxia uh, victims at the Supreme Court in the Philippines. On human rights violations, as mentioned uh, yesterday evening by uh, our colleagues from HELP, the, uh, the fascist uh, government has gross violations on human dignity and human life. Karapatan has recorded uh, the Tokham is one of the anti-war, anti-drug campaign of the, the, the Duterte government that has killed 13,000 innocent uh, Filipinos, including minors and children. The U.S. government has gave the Philippines, our government, a roughly 13,000 military aid, or military aid, since the Marawi siege has uh, broke. There have been, according to Karapatan, the, uh, the human rights organization in the Philippines, there have been 126 extrajudicial killings in the two years of our president, 235 prostrated PJ case, 1,202 illegal arrests, 17 of the PJ case are women, 43 women victims of illegal arrest and detention. There are the list of women who have been killed by our administration and justice has not been served. Resource grabbing and militarization is prevalent. More than 480,000 individuals were displaced in Mindanao in 2017 alone. Harassments in the indigenous communities that have built their own schools and agricultural uh, uh, facilities have been displaced and highly militarized at this point. So what women want, women say to an uh, eman emancipation, take a stand against misogyny and violence against women. People, both men and women, need to organize and dismantle the system that perpetuates such views. Gabriela has consistently opposed the gender oppression and persecution statements against anti-women remarks of our president. Last May, Gabriela was part of the various women's group, women's rights advocates, personalities, and artists have launched the hashtag Babayako. Lalaban ako, or hashtag I am a woman, I will fight back uh, against the Duterte macho fascist through social media and other campaigns. The women, hash, uh, the women of hashtag babae ako were named as one of the most influential uh, people named by the Time Magazine in 2018. Women seeking change to community organizing and mobilization. So we, do, we, we do trainings, uh, capacity building, and actions. Women seeking change through a uh, call for genuine land reform, decent work, uh, living wage, We have this Bukalan, or the Occupy and Till the Land. Uh, one of those is the Hacienda Lubisita, owned by the last president of the, of the Philippines. Also in Hacienda Uy in Quezon. Employment is the primary indi uh, indication of women's empowerment, but with the labor flexibility scheme in case due to 
the neoliberal economic design, the opportunity of women has been limited. So employment is uh, low. Uh, there's a trend of working women that are self-employed. 4.5 million Filipinos are self-employed. 1.75 million employed in private household or what we call um, kasambahay or household help. Non-regular workers, women uh, have no right, deprives the right to form the, uh, association or form unions inside the factories. They remain uh, non-regular workers or co contractor workers. The work are labor extensive and uh, receive a cheap amount of salary. Women also face uh, unsafe and unhealthy situation in the workplace. So there have been uh, documented cases of fire uh, inside the factories. We have the NCC Mall in Davao, the Yokohama Tire in May 2017, the Kentex fire that has killed 74 workers because of the violation of the uh, fire safety standard. It was in May 2017. Um, in the recent development, the Occupational Safety and Health Law has been signed by our government and now uh, the implementing rules and regulation is, is now in, in progress. So KMP um, is following up and monitors the implementation of the OSH law in the Philippines. The next is the achievement of the Progressive Women's Organization, the Gabriela Women's Party in the lower house. The expanded maternity leave pin has been, sa has been approved at the back by cameral session, meaning that the house, uh, the upper house and the lower house, and is awaiting the signing of the president for its implementation. From 100, from 60 days to 105 days, maternity leave benefits among the public and private uh, uh, women workers. As more women understand their plight, the move through various modes of resistance and persistence to find the road to emancipation. At times like this, they often go against the current. Some march into streets, calling for jobs and justice, food and freedom. They build resistance and movements. While others believe in the power of vote to change leaders, some realize the power of arms to achieve societal change. Whatever modes that they choose, women find the importance of solidarity. Solidarity among themselves, solidarity among other sectors, and solidarity with other nations that are also calling for freedom from imperialist subjugation. Solidarity is the implicit factor to gather more voices and gain spaces to achieve victory. Women now that when all the oppressed people unite, an upsurge of liberating action will pave the road to emancipation. Good morning. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Uh, to both of you, the Ovid and Jacobi Unibus, to tell the situation in Philippines now, I present the fascist government is existing in a country and the military and others are uh, backed by the government, then it, we can think about the worst condition, not only the women, also the low socioeconomic people that uh, men and women have uh, affected. But I, the, your, both organizations are working since 1984. I think you cover, both of you are the uh, psychologists, but out of that also you expand your program to solidarity making with the other women organizations and also in the lower part of it you are pushing your program. So this is a very, uh, I think, uh, hope 
of the uh, program, but uh, with the PHM, in future we can also raise the voice and not only the Philippines, in, the, in our world we can see the same similar things are also happening in the other part of the world, other country of the world, there is a similarity. So we can uh, take this opportunity of the PHM, a global PHM, to have the future of our uh, solidarity with all these type of action and the world. Thank you very much. Uh, I forget to introduce myself, so the volunteer told me to introduce myself. I am chairing, I am at the Laila Patrin Pandu, my name, and I am a medical doctor, and at present I am a vice chancellor of the Gono Vishwavidala, that means the Gono University. But uh, I am also the active member of the PHM, PHM uh, Bangladesh and also global because when we are organizing the PHA assembly one in GK, also I was there. And uh, I am a freedom fighter in 1971 in the field, that time I was a third year medical student and uh, after that, I uh, finished my education and again joined in GK in 1975. So, my work, I am a worker of the Ganeshastra Kendra also. So, thank you. Now, we can go for next uh, speaker. Uh, she is uh, Lada Wagen and she is from Croatia. Uh, Lada Wagen is a member of the organization of Women's Initiative and Democratize from the uh, Jagra. That is their organization in Croatia and participates in the activism of the PHM in Europe. Through the work of the local research group, she researches the impact of the commercialization of the health care in Croatia on accessibility of the health care. So I welcome Lada Wagen. Please start your Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to be here, but I should just uh, let you all know that I only had two days to prepare, so please apologize if there is not so much detail here, uh, and I would be very happy to uh, direct you to some uh, authors later if you're interested in uh, uh, maybe some uh, more comprehensive research of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so what, I'm, what I would like to speak about today uh, I would like to provide uh, you a short overview of uh, women's uh, reproductive health care in Croatia uh, and then on an example of a uh, very recent and very vocal uh, movement uh, or action that happened in Croatia I would like to show uh, what are the consequences of uh, providing health care to women uh, in a patriarchal and uh, neoliberal context and maybe we can see uh, one way uh, that we can use uh, such actions uh, to build a stronger movement for, um, for protecting and uh, enhancing women's rights. Uh, so, uh, just shortly, um, as you uh, may know, uh, Croatia um, gained independence from Yugoslavia in 1990, but before that, in Yugoslavia, we had a uh, uh, socialist system that uh, relied very heavily on uh, comprehensive uh, universal access to healthcare. And this is something that has been gradually dissolving uh, since we uh, switched from socialism to capitalism. So in the recent years there's, there's just been a great increase in number of private gynecological practices after the change in legislation in 1993. Uh, so this uh, Healthcare Act in 1993, um, it dissolved the medical centers that we had, which uh, incorporated primary and secondary care. And so primary and secondary care were separated into two uh, different uh, uh, parts. Uh, and uh, this way, gynecological practices started being privatized. 
these were some of the first ones that were part of the primary healthcare and that could be privatized along with uh, dentistry, uh, general practitioners, uh, and uh, yeah, and some uh, some uh, other forms of uh, private healthcare. Uh, one other thing is that uh, uh, with this act, uh, people could choose their own um, physician, so they could choose where to which gynecologist to visit. Before that, they would be assigned to a certain practice uh, based on the area they live in. So, of course, this means that uh, people will, that some practices will have more patients and the others will have less. And there is a great uh, disbalance in the way uh, patients are distributed among uh, practices. So, uh, of course, the number of private practices has risen, but uh, there are not enough public practices. Now. For example, in the capital city of Zagreb, uh, there is a deficit of nine gynecological uh, offices or practices, which means that 54,000 women, and I just, just, we just know that there are 4 million people in Croatia, so this is a large number for us. Uh, 54,000 women are uh, suboptimally dispersed among the practices. And uh, also, one of the consequences of this is there has been a significant drop in the number of visits to uh, gynecologists. For example, between 2005 and 2012, there has been a 30% drop. So this means that women are visiting their doctors really less often than before, because uh, either there is too many uh, patients for one practice and you need to wait for even a year to get an appointment, or if you cannot wait, you have to go to a private practice and you have to pay. And uh, sums are not slow, of course, in private practices, so uh, a lot of women cannot afford it. And so the continuity of uh, protecting reproductive health uh, in women uh, has been, uh, uh, has been uh, affected by this. And also our government, because we are an aging population, the number of births is uh, not keeping up with the number of old people and the number of deaths. Uh, the Croatian government is trying, or at least saying that they're trying to address this problem, uh, but they're doing it by measures that do not take into account the socio-economical conditions that women and men face in Croatia today. So, for example, one of the measures proposed was to keep give uh, each uh, household 1,000 euros for a uh, new, newborn baby and this is a very, very short-term measure that doesn't tackle the systemic problems uh, we face. Uh, of course, there are many, many issues related to reproductive health in women, but uh, I would just uh, touch upon some of them. Uh, so, regarding birthing practices, seven out of Ten women receive the hormonal drip, uh, which um, speeds up the, the birth. More than 50% of vaginal births end with episiotomy. Uh, more than 50% of births include the uh, Cristella maneuver, meaning that the doctor uh, lies on the woman's stomach to push the baby out, uh, which is considered uh, quite dangerous in, the, in the modern uh, practices. And there has been a significant rise in the number of uh, cesareans. Uh, so between 2001, uh, there was uh, only 12% of cesareans. And in 2014, so in, in just a matter of 13 years, uh, this has doubled. So uh, almost, it's now uh, almost 20%. I mean meaning that every fifth woman has a cesarean, um, which is not, uh, uh, it's not a good indicator. And um, related to the uh, emotional and social experience women have when giving birth, um, an association called Parents in Action conducted a, a survey, and uh, uh, three quarters of women said that the doctors uh, didn't introduce themselves in the delivery room, and that they talked about women in the third person. They called her she, it, or the case. Um, and even though uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Croatian hospitals there exists equipment such as the birthing stool, bathtub, uh, the Pilates ball, it is offered in only one tenth of cases. So it means it just lies there and it's 
is not offered to women. Uh, and also 64% of women uh, felt that the medical staff didn't have enough patience for them, that they were just uh, trying to uh, uh, go through their day uh, as fast as uh, possible without uh, uh, addressing their needs uh, carefully enough. And uh, every third woman stated that uh, all of these experiences uh, have had a negative impact on their mood after birth, which can of course lead to uh, post-birth depression, and influence their opinion on whether to have another child. Um, so um, now I'm going to um, present to you this uh, action that happened. Uh, so about a month ago, while the Croatian parliament was deciding on a vote of no confidence to the Minister of Healthcare, one of the members of parliament uh, shared her experience of uh, post-abortion curatage, meaning this is the, the procedure of scraping the inside of the uterus after an abortion. And she said that it was performed without anesthesia, that she was tied to the bed, and that she had to endure 30 minutes of severe physical pain. So she said this uh, within a parliament uh, session, and this prompted a widespread reaction among women with similar experiences who started, started sharing these experiences on social media. So the, the NGO I mentioned, Parents in Action, uh, they decided to take an opportunity to re revive their campaign called Break the Silence. And they invited women to send them written accounts of their experiences. So I will just go through a couple of these, just so you can see what, uh, what the women were speaking about. So uh, women would write their uh, accounts uh, by hand and send it uh, to this uh, association. So one of them said, uh, two days after an abortion performed in a Zagreb hospital, I had to undergo a curatage again. Uh, the doctor scraped the already traumatized uterus, surrounded by a cheerful team, and made a joke, saying that this is what happens when you like men too much. I was young then, but today I would certainly respond and report everything. The other one said, uh, on the 15th of March of 2007, in a Vukovar hospital, Kirtash without anesthesia was performed, even though I asked for anesthesia because of psychological distress. I was 10 weeks pregnant and the baby's heart stopped. They held me down and grabbed my hands, legs and head, and the doctor called me spoiled for crying. My complaint to the head of the hospital was rejected without an apology, only the pain remained. Uh, in a Zagreb hospital in 2016. After a difficult birth where they filled me with hormone drip and refused any anesthesia, my baby was born using vacuum and didn't start crying immediately, so they took him away. The cherry on top of the cake was the, oh, the, cake, uh, was the suing without anesthesia, which was called, so the doctor uh, called it cosmetical suing, so it would look better for my husband. Another one said that uh, a doctor told them in 2007, of course it hurts, you only use two legs for walking. Apes walk on four legs, so it hurts them less. And another one said that in Zagreb in 2017, after my episiotomy stitches tore, a week after giving birth, I went to the ER where I was met by an older doctor known for his harshness. He, is get, he examined me very roughly, uh, the wound was still open and festering, and said, Tell your husband not to look down there anymore, and everything will be okay. And the last one uh, says, uh, It was my first pregnancy, I was 25 years old. It was my first visit to the pregnancy clinic. I didn't know I was supposed to come in the morning. They were nervous about it, but the doctor said he would examine me now. The nurse warned me that I might bleed a little, but that it was normal. The doctor performed such a brutal exam that it can be characterized as rape. I was out of my mind. He prescribed diazepam and said that this is what happens when I'm obviously still, still very active down there. I cried on the way home and barely walked. Um, so what we can see is that uh, there are many accounts of women's pain being uh, ignored, dismissed, and their right, uh, right to body autonomy ignored. Uh, the requests for anesthesia were also rejected without explanation. And there are uh, many, many, many accounts such as the ones that I read now. 
and uh, most of uh, many of them placed uh, they uh, they placed uh, in, uh, focus on uh, women's responsibility for the, for uh, for experiencing this pain that it was as if it was their fault. Uh, doctors and and nurses and other medical staff would sometimes say. Uh, you didn't scream while you were having sex, why are you screaming now? And uh, just uh, as if this wasn't enough, so people started like sharing their experiences and then of course the authorities had to react. So after the, uh, after the member of parliament uh, expressed her, uh, shared her story, um, the, so this was in the parliament, and right after she said this, the president of Croatian parliament, who is a 51 year old male, said, this puts me in a very uncomfortable situation, but you're saying is very intimate, as if uh, it was not appropriate to talk about such things in a parliament, and, and as if his, his uh, un uh, feeling of uh, uncomfort as a man discussing women's issues was more important than what she was saying. And the Croatian Minister of Healthcare, after being silent for two days, uh, and uh, claimed that uh, many women don't know they received anesthesia and that what they were saying was untrue and he tried to justify it by saying the needle injection is, is sometimes so gentle that the patients, meaning women, uh, don't know they receive anesthesia. Uh, and then uh, a few days ago he said the missus, meaning the, the member of parliament, uh, she lied. And um, right after uh, the Member of Parliament shared her story. Um, the head of the Clinic for Women's Diseases and Birth in Split, where she says this happened, uh, said, this was not curatage, but vacuum aspiration. Each such procedure includes local or general anesthesia. And then he provided a detailed account of her medical history, which was supposed to serve to explain that she obviously doesn't understand what was happening to her and that she must have received anesthesia. And he said, I'm sorry that such statements cause unnecessary concern in our patients. Um, so, um, what happened in this uh, action break silence is that more than 400 testimonies were printed and handed in to the Minister of Healthcare. Um, they said that they uh, examined each and one of them and decided that uh, there are no many, not, not so many actions they can take because all of them were anonymous and that it doesn't require some ministry uh, action. Uh, they did conduct an investigation in this particular case uh, for this particular uh, woman and uh, they said that uh, she received anesthesia and that uh, nothing was uh, wrong. But uh, in the end, the head of the split clinic, uh, he was, he is now under an investigation for divulging the medical history details in public. Um, uh, and um, yes, uh, so the, the reaction of the government and of the authorities uh, shows that conservative and uh, patriarchal practices they still continue to undermine women's access to healthcare because uh, what we can see from these accounts is uh, what and what women very often said in the testimonies is that they will never set foot in a, uh, in a, a hospital again. They will never have another child because they're so afraid of uh, reliving this pain. Um, and uh, this is actually a symptom which is present in many other. Uh, Fears of the society, women are supposed to suffer in silence. Uh, for example, this is the case in domestic violence as well. And uh, this is particularly problematic when it has to do with uh, physical pain and health. Uh, but um, I wanted also to focus on what we can do uh, at this point. So we had this uh, big initiative. Uh, and um, more than 40 associations and institutions supported uh, the, this initiative and there were some follow-up actions organized so uh, women would uh, print, uh, make a bloody uh, print of their hands 
and they would post it on as many public institutions as they could, just as a symbol of their resistance and to show that uh, they will no longer be silent about such practices. Um, and one very positive effect is that uh, medical professionals predominantly, of course not the ones that I cited before, but uh, they predominantly aligned with women, which is uh, usually not the case because the medical professionals in Croatia are usually um, uh, very reluctant to take part in some wider uh, health rights actions. They're mostly just focused on their own uh, uh, agendas. Um, and um, so this this action allowed the women's voice, voices to be heard and uh, it actually empowered them to speak out because uh, many women in their testimonies they said they thought it was normal it was normal to experience 30 to, uh, to 30 minutes to an hour and a half of excruciating pain of screaming, of being tied down and uh, not uh, being able to uh, receive any relief for this. And because they thought this was normal, they didn't speak about uh, this. So this action allowed them to share their experience and to break, literally break the silence. And uh, one of the positive effects of the um, action was that it focused on the system, not on the individuals, because it might have easily happened that uh, the focus would be put on individual doctors who did this. And this was not the case, but uh, uh, the women and everybody involved in the actions, they did uh, try to focus on the systemic roots of such problems. So it's not just the birthing practices, it's not just abortion, it's a wider problem in, in a society that's still run by patriarchic uh, uh, norms. Um, and uh, also it's important to put the issue of women's rights in a wider social context so we cannot only deal with reproductive rights we have to see why it's important to uh, look at uh, reproductive rights to rights to employment, uh, rights to children uh, care and so on and to uh, get a wider picture because only then we can try to uh, really, tackle, uh, really tackle the problem and uh, of course, uh, it prompted a discussion, discussion on women's reproductive health that's wider than, than uh, the ongoing discussion on the right to abortion. So, primarily before this, in Croatia, the main uh, discussion related to women's uh, health care and uh, body autonomy was uh, almost exclusively tied to abortion. And, of course, the pro or the against uh, arguments. Uh, but this, uh, uh, this now spread the discussion and uh, the general public was made aware that we should all try to think about other aspects of uh, women's uh, health and the right to health. Uh, so this added to certainty and uh, continuity of women's resistance uh, because, um, uh, because there have been other uh, other movements uh, in the Croatian society uh, to uh, to strengthen women's position, and this now maybe will allow everybody to gather around one topic and to try to um, spread their actions and uh, to keep in mind this wider context that we should be uh, aware of when addressing the women's uh, rights. So uh, this is uh, what I wanted to say. Um, Thank you very much, Lebe uh, Oregon. This is a really nice presentation on the how cruel the profession of the doctors. This is the first time I heard that in a massive way in a country, nation, they are doing the uh, curators of the interest without anesthesia. So, uh, this is a violation of the professional ethics of the doctors also. So, I think now inside your uh, parliament or other, you, I think we can also have raised this question international uh, court that uh, this is a big issue of the violence. So, in other country also, they have the violation of many ethics also if I say about our 
Bangladesh and the other developing country, uh, the health service is now professional and business. Business means that from the pharmaceutical the business system, from the service giving the doctor, nurse and the owner of the hospital, private hospital and owner of the clinics also they are violating the ethics and out of pocket expense also rising everywhere though the uh, some government uh, hospital they supposed to give the uh, free of cost service but you have to when you are going for your treatment you have to spend money out of your pocket so i think the initiative uh, you are taking in your country that is a rise the voice of this type of ill treatment by professional by uh, that means a massive uh, way it is not that one or two doctors are doing that thing it is a whole country gynecologist or the other doctors are doing that so i think that uh, this is good to has the voice rises from the women and also this we can take a uh, step to through the PHM, global PHM, we can also initiate this uh, crime against the women in whole world. That one is an example the case study in your country, but more or less similar things are happening in the world mainly the general people and those are not affordable for the rich people who are afford to have the service and the power. It is a play of the power. If the power people are supporting this type of doctors or the procedures, then it is very difficult to change. But we must have our rise the voice to the PHM and also Anyway, if anything happens, you must raise your voice. Then, uh, silence is a crime. Okay, thank you very much. And I can appreciate your, as a young age, you are in this PHM. So, there is a more hope if the young girls and people are coming. Now, uh, now the uh, next speaker is a Dr. Tanmeen Azim from Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Tasneem Azim has, uh, has a medical background and a PhD in Immunology and Virology from UCL. Her career started in 1989 as a scientist in the ICDDRB an international research organization in Bangladesh. She was the director of the program of HIV and AIDS and head of the virology laboratory. When she left ICDTRB in 2016, she is now a freelancer, public health specialist and an active member of the Nari Pokka that is in Bangladesh. Nari Pokho is a women rights organization and health is one of its priorities. Okay, please, I can ask. Okay, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. I want to thank the PHM for inviting me to this talk. But at the very outset, I want to say that I have a very bad cough and I might break out into coughing fits. I've got water with me, I've got a mic. Speak more. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now it is. Now it is okay. I'll try my best. Um, I might have to um, take a few breaks or what. So, um, my talk will be somewhat different. I'm going to try and bring in different diverse evidence from different parts of the world to see how gender, uh, how health is affected by, or how gender affects health. So, um, so let's first look at the SDGs. I'm 
this is the top of the world. And we know that SDG, SDG 3 and 5 are... Please close your mic. Close. ...are already talking about gender. But it's not just those two SDGs. Gender is a cross-cutting issue across all SDGs. And here I'm taking directly from a paper that was published recently, where it shows that gender influences health and well-being across three domains. This is the concept that the authors have come up with. And the three domains include, there's no pointer, The three domains include, the first one is through uh, its interaction with social, economic and commercial determinants of health. We've been hearing a lot of that, which we also call structural determinants of health. And the second is health behaviors that are individual, that can be protective or can be detrimental. And the third is the response of the health systems. And this can affect uh, health in very many different ways. That's also been talked about. In my talk, I will try and cover the second and the third aspects, and that also very broadly, because in this given time, it's not possible to go into details. So, um, my talk is divided into three parts. First, I will be presenting data from um, looking, uh, this is looking at how gender responses are world, responsive are the world's most influential global health organizations. This is uh, work done by a group at UCL, and I'll talk about it more. Then I'll move on to give examples of uh, gender health in terms of HIV and drug use, and how women fit into that picture. And then, on, which is a highly stigmatized, highly marginalized group of people. And then on a more general area of water and sanitation, which affects everybody. And finally, when we talk about gender and health, we cannot forget about the sexual minorities. And that's a whole huge topic on its own. And I will not really delve in that except to present one slide to show how SOGI has been included in health records in the uh, US, in California. So let's start with the first one. The Global Health Report is, uh, I've got a complete report here with me if anyone is interested, it can be downloaded as well. This has been done by Global Health 5050, which is an initiative of UCL. And it's, what it does, it, what is, it has done, it has uh, looked at 140 organizations across the world. These organizations are all global health organizations, which includes Crack, by the way. And it's looking at how gender responsive are the world's most influential global health organizations. And it's looked at two dimensions. One is gender responsive programs and policies, whether those organizations have policies and programs in place, and gender equality in the workplace. So how do they treat their people in the workplace? They have looked at, um, there is a desk review, they've looked at published websites, and they have a whole uh, description of how they sample. But what they call global health actors are organizations that work in at least three countries. And they look at the organizations that they looked at are bilateral donor agencies, UN agencies, civil society organizations, global PPPs, philanthropic funders, private sector consulting firms, all of whom have been involved in health in at least three countries in the world. Now, I don't know how clear that is up there, but they have looked across seven domains. And this is where I need to point out. The first domain is it has the organization issued a public statement of commitment to gender equality. Do they say somewhere, anywhere in their website? And um, I really don't know how clear that is. But um, I'm going to look at it over here. The second column of the first, of the very first one, is looking at um, UN. Green is good, red is not good. And amber is in between. So the UN organizations and the bilateral and multilateral and consulting firms in their websites have committed, most of them, to uh, gender equality. If we move on to the second one, that talks about definition of gender. When they talk about gender equality, do they define the gender as in its, uh, in its norm? And again, UN organizations.
patients at bilateral and multilateral were doing very well. The others not so well. If you look at workplace policies, which is the third one, here UN systems again doing very well, and surprisingly consultancy firms are doing quite well, and private sectors as well. Whereas we don't have the bilaterals, multilaterals, and civil societies at bottom most of that. So um, it's quite surprising to see that workplace policies, having a sexual harassment policy uh, or other policies in place, here there is quite a bit of variation. If we go down to the second row, looking at programmatic policies to guide gender responsive actions, again UN and bilateral doing very well, and so are global civil society organizations. Then the fifth one is collecting sex aggregate, collecting and reporting sex aggregated data. Here UN and bilateral doing well, civil society less than half, the others not at all well. The private sector hopeless, which is the last one, and uh, consulting firms also not too well. Now we move on to the uh, to the organizations themselves, what do they do for their staff? So we're looking at the Second row, the last one, is gender parity in senior management. And here, no one is doing well. No one. Overall, which is the first column, it's just 25%. Even the UN system has only 43%. If we go down to the third row, gender parity in the governing body. Here too, very poor performance. And, and the last two here talks about gender of head of board. The darker blue is women, and this one is gender of executive director. And here, only in the UN system, which is uh, the third one, that is the best, but everyone is doing very poorly at the workplace. So this, uh, this is done very recently. And uh, to move on further, we look at how, uh, there's how, how this distribution takes place. If you look at the global health workforce, it's mainly female. Whereas if you look at senior management, the female proportion is very low. If you look at global health force for males, that is low, but senior management for males is much higher. Overall, if we look by categories of organizations, I can't tell how good this is over here. Um, this is the... This is quite bad. Sorry. Alright, basically, here you have the green is good, green is good. These three groups, that's the UN system, bilaterals and the civil society are generally better. The private sector and the others, the consulting firms, are not so good. So overall, this is giving you a global picture of how gender is being taken into account in the policies and in the workplace. In the global work, uh, these are the top global uh, health organizations in the world. And this has been a wake-up call and we hope action is going to take place based on this data. And I personally found this very useful, although it is only about men and women, but this is the very beginning. Again, we have no, I mean, the question of sexual minorities, I guess the one will arise, but this is a situation in men and women. But this is a very good basic ground, and BRAC is part of this. So I, you can actually go into BRAC and see how BRAC is doing. Um, so I'm going to move away now from this whole how organizations function and how they look at gender to a very different topic of HIV and women and drug use. This is my own area of work and I'm looking at global data, not just participation. And we have been working on this and we're trying to uh, bring female substance users to the center of the global HIV response. It's been an uphill battle and it still is but um, I'll show you why uh, this is very important. Now, women who inject drugs are significant in number. There are about 16 million people who inject drugs, of whom roughly around one-fourth are women. 
and the global data shows that marginally higher numbers of women, the chances of women getting HIV from injecting drug use is slightly higher for women than it is for men. And the data from different countries shows that. So FWIDs means females who inject drugs and NWIDs males who inject drugs. So the ochre color is females and as you, as you can see in most countries HIV is higher in women who inject drugs or females who inject drugs. But women or females who inject drugs, most of them sell sex as well. And that is why they have a dual risk and that's what separates them a lot from men. And we have data from three countries to show that. Tanzania, um, Nepal, Bangladesh, you can see that half to the vast majority of women who use drugs also sell sex. Now, why do they sell sex? Often to support their own drug habit, but often to support their partner's drug habit as well. Um, sorry, this is right. Um, well, for women who use drugs and sell sex, there are multiple vulnerabilities for HIV and STI. Sharing meals and syringes is common for all people who use drugs. Drugs and more so for women, and it has been shown that women are often sending to the needle. So, if they are work is if they're injecting in a group and there are men and women, it is usually the women who get the last injection. So, or they're always sending to the needle. If they're engaged in sex, it's often street based, which means it's highly risky. Sexual concurrency, they have multiple partners. The high risk sex, as we said, that because they're in the streets, they have usually it's very quick, it's often uh, multiple partners at the same time, and they usually do not have control over this whole activity around sex and drug use. They're definitely subject to sexual violence, and they are highly stigmatized, more so than the males who inject drugs. Often, women who, most women who inject drugs have males as partners who inject drugs. Um, and their intimate partners, or the women often rely on those intimate partners for them to get them the drugs. Women usually do not go out, go out and buy the drugs, their male partners buy them. And they also help them inject the drugs. So the relationship between a female and a male who are injecting drugs is one of trust, often of love and dependency. But at the same time, it's a patriarchal society, there is Men, there are the men are actually controlling their lives, whether it's for taking drugs or whether it's for selling sex or whether it's in their own relationship. So if we look at how how the relationship works out for women who inject drugs vis-a-vis their male partners, the males control the drugs, how they get them, and to how they take them. They control the clients, they're often pimps. They control condom use. Because if they are selling sex and they can get more money without condoms, it will be the males who will dictate that. There's always a threat of violence, and violence is there, both physical and sexual. So the women, men are subject to these as well, but women are doubly subject to these because they're under the control of the men, their own intimate partners. And of course they have special needs, the reproductive health needs. This is an example from Tijuana, where a woman had to give birth in a canal, and that was because she could not access uh, reproductive health care services. That's because she was a female who injected drugs and they would not accept her. So they really, what is really needed are non-judgmental antenatal clinics. We've just heard from Croatia, the problem that all women face. So you can imagine these stigmatized women, what they go through. They need birth control. They're keeping in mind that the drugs they take and what what the ideal method for them to use so that they get proper advice. Advice of birth spacing, point of care for STI services, diabetes hubs, etc, etc, etc. But they need all these services, which is very difficult for them to access in a very stigmatized situation. They also need child care. A lot of women have children who inject drugs. And what we found in our research, and others have also found, that having children and needing to provide care for them can be a motivation for making lifestyle changes, including reducing drug use. We found that relapse following drug treatment is more common among uh, females who inject drugs versus males who inject drugs. 
she will have some more common in there. And women without children to support were more than three times likely to relapse than women who had children. So really having children was a motivation to become well. And again, as we said that why, well, where child care services are available, not in Bangladesh, but in many parts of the developed world. This is global data. This includes the US, it includes many parts of the world where proper services for injecting, injecting people who inject drugs are not available. But there are a lack of child care services. They do not have access to them. And if they do have access, they often fear that they lose their child, that they will be taken away by the social services. Violence is a very big issue, and the perpetrators, perpetrators are multiple, including law enforcement, intimate partners, and of course their clients. And there is a general feeling that clients will not be criminalized for the violence, and that women will not be protected by police. So um, that was the aspect from a highly stigmatized, a very special group, a very marginalized group that is often, often goes unrecognized, even in the world of HIV, even in the world of drug treatment. So just moving on very quickly to everyday issues, water sanitation, and how women are affected by this much more than men. And I will just, I will not spend a lot of time on this because um, we, have, we don't have much time. But this is important because women are primary water collectors worldwide. And I've just taken this from uh, uh, an article from The Lancet. And what happens when they fetch water, they become, they're obviously subject to lots of uh, unhygiene conditions, so they can get all sorts of infections. And they have, as a result, they get chronic or persistent infection. On top of that, the physical effort of carrying water causes fatigue. Navigation of uneven terrain with substantial water loads can cause injury, especially if you are pregnant, carrying babies, or have recently given birth. Water fetching, bathing, and education in the open expose women and girls to sexual harassment. Women might respond to insufficient water resources by limitation of water intake and personal hygiene behaviors, resulting in psychosocial distress, also resulting in a lot of UTIs and other infections. Women's hygiene victim and mental menstrual cycle is often ignored in design and delivery of water and sanitation, increasing their susceptibility to urinary infections. This is a wide range of effects that women can have from a simple thing like getting water for the family, for themselves, for the community. And we don't even think about this. And finally, I will have, I just have one slide for the sexual minorities and that's so deep, that's sexual orientation and gender identity. And I'm just bringing this out from uh, again the data. This has been taken from the University of California Davis. Um, what, they, what they have done is try and um, include SOHI demographic data into the electronic health records. Now, in order to provide services, because I, I guess because I'm a researcher, I believe in evidence and uh, whatever scholarly evidence you collect, like that we have from Croatia, we have from the Philippines, we have from many parts of the world, ultimately, if we do not get quantifiable data, a lot of people in the professional world will not respond. So we need evidence for action. So one of the things that we need, therefore, is to get SOGI demographic data into electronic health records so we understand what happens to men, women, others. So that gives us an understanding, okay, they have these needs, they come with these problems, and these are the health issues that they have. So in order to introduce SOGI into the electronic health records, a whole system was established in the University of California, Davis, for the health systems. And this whole system was set it up, which finally did get set up in 2013. It started in 2009. And it took four years for it to actually be launched in 2013. To formation of task forces, to building awareness, to training, to running trials of different um, forms and how to collect data to be very sensitive and so on and so forth. It was a very long, long process. And finally, 
I found her presentation. Non-regular workers. I found her presentation. Non-regular workers in Philippines are deprived of the right association. Then what is the mode of organizing them and mobilizing for the cause of women? The thing is that in your country there is provision of maternity for only 105 days. While in our country, that is India, we have the provision of maternity leave for 180 days. This thing I would like to share with the gatherings. And third thing I would like to know, what is the ratio of the women workforce in the total workforce of 15? And whether, whether there is wage parity between male workers and female workers. And just just a minute. And what step is being taken by your organization to improve this situation? And and lastly, one story from the presenter from the Croatia. Uh, I will simply would like to know what the status and policy has been taken by the Croatian government to rehabilitate the women of Croatia ravaged by the war. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Another one. And uh, a way of solidarity to everyone. Uh, my concern is uh, the story about the Croatia. This is a uh, something that is very much, for me, very touching. And I want to urge each country today to start talking about respectful maternity care. Respectful maternity care starts from the time the woman is, has conceived, from the time this woman is going through antenatal, from the time this woman is going through labor and delivery up to postnatal. So each country should start today starts orienting everyone who is in contact with a woman to start talking about respect to maternity care. It should be a maid, a cleaner, a, be it a nurse, be it a doctor, everyone should be talking about respect to maternity care. A woman has the right to have a child and to have a child in the right environment and with quality care. So today I'm urging every nation, including Croatia, let's not just talk about, let's not just talk about breaking the silence but acting by ensuring that everybody is talking about respect to maternity care. These are things that are happening everywhere, including Africa. And today we are advocating for respect for maternity care everywhere. Be it a man, starting from the husband, the time that your wife is pregnant, start respecting her because she needs to go through respect for maternity care and she deserves to have the right to have a child in a very good environment and without pain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is an announcement. Uh, today in the evening, there is a, in the afternoon, there is a workshop on the gender and women's health. So please, uh, you can discuss there. The who want to uh, have some point there. Now, the shortage of the time. I conclude this uh, supplementary. Thanks. And thanks and thanks one thing that help for all